Well, hi, everyone, and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, I'd like to do a short follow-up on my video from yesterday about Brandon Toy's ripoff of Brian Mullins and his little plane over the rotating Earth conundrum. Now, sometimes when I do videos on flat earthers, they stomp their little feet and get all upset in the comments section of the video. Brandon fell right into that, and while it's very amusing to me to watch a grown adult have a temper tantrum, I thought maybe we would address some of his comments. So, let's cue up the music, and then we'll go to the comments on the video. Okay, so here's the internal comment section on the video, and as you see, Brandon Toy came in and said, I didn't answer the three questions. Fail. I think this is just great. Now, the reason, Brandon, I didn't answer your three questions is that I destroyed the basis of your questions during the course of the video. You just lack the insight and the understanding of the subject to see how badly I did that. So, let's present Brandon's three questions for ball earthers regarding flights over a spinning earth. Question number one. The flight covered 8,183 miles in six hours and 54 minutes. Its average speed was 1,186 miles an hour. At 60 degrees north, they inherited 513 miles per hour in momentum on the plane. Probably used the word momentum wrong, so I'll hear about that. In order to meet the reported and required ground speeds at each waypoint, the plane must increase its speed in space. During the last leg of the trip, the plane's engine must provide an average of 850 miles per hour worth of power in order to accelerate to the 1,363 miles an hour. Now, as you may recall, the entire basis of Brandon's argument was that once the aircraft left the ground, it became completely detached from the rotating surface of the Earth, and the atmosphere somehow wasn't rotating either. And as a result, the aircraft had to follow this elaborate flight path over some 8,000 miles in space. Now, this is skyvector.com, which is online flight planning software. It's free to use. Any of you can go to this website and do this exact same flight path. You just hit flight plan right here, and then you put in the departure airport code, which is PANC for Ted Stevens International Airport, and then the arrival airport, which is Benito Warhez International Airport in Mexico City, and here's the designator for that airport, MMMX, and you will get this actual flight path, which is the ground track of the aircraft. Then you go ahead and hit nav log right here, and that will bring up this file, and it shows you that there is 3,283 miles in that flight path. Now, that took seven hours, and I believe in the actual flight, it was a little bit longer because they had to divert for some weather down by Los Angeles or, or Las Vegas. Now, to answer your first question, Brandon, you didn't properly chart the flight path of this aircraft, nor the ground track. The ground track of the aircraft is this magenta line. The airplane continuously followed this magenta line all the way from Anchorage, Alaska, down to Mexico City, and with that slight variation for weather that I mentioned. It did not go out in this part of the world. It started in Anchorage, Alaska, and it ended up in Mexico City. So this nonsense that you put up, that's not the flight path. It never was the flight path. So your entire question is moot because it covered the exact distance that is expected and in the amount of time that was expected, which was about seven hours. So there's your first question answered. So let's just move along to question number two. Question number two, the route taken for the flight isn't the optimal route. It is the geodetic great circle route based on a stationary Earth. This is the route that you would plan if we were on a stationary flat plane or a stationary globe, essentially. Well, that's your problem right there, Brandon. This is not the great circle course between Anchorage, Alaska and Mexico City. This is something that you put out based on your flat Earth narrative. So while you made up the other route, here's the actual route from flight planning software along the Great Circle course between Anchorage, Alaska and Mexico City. So the fact that you put up the wrong route and ground track for that flight doesn't change the fact that this is the correct one and the flight followed it. And the speeds and the times 
all matched up given the airspeed of the aircraft that you provided. Thank you, Brandon. Now we're gonna go along and listen to you a little bit more, maybe see if there's anything else to this question, and then we'll go on to the third and final question. Why don't the pilots of the flight take the rotation of the Earth into account when planning their flight and go a different heading? Why is their flight path the same as it would be on a stationary uh, Earth? Well, they don't take the rotation of the Earth into account because, truthfully, they don't need to. It has no bearing on their ground track. What they do is they plot this flight out and they follow the ground track. You're not controlling it based on the rotation of the Earth. You're controlling it based on the fact that the ground track is directly below your aircraft. So long as you keep that ground track directly below your aircraft, the rotational speed of the Earth, etc., is just imparted on your aircraft. Now recall, Brandon, your big claim was that on a north-south aircraft flight, you would have to account for some 500 miles per hour of increased rotation of the Earth. Okay. That's fine. That's kind of the basis of the Coriolis effect. However, in order to make that flight, it took some 420 minutes, which meant that on average, every minute, you had to account for what is essentially a crosswind of about a mile and a half or two miles an hour. This in an environment that has crosswinds of up to 140 miles an hour. You wouldn't even notice that you were doing this. It's kind of like maintaining your car on the road. You make small, tiny little corrections just to kind of keep it in the center of your lane. That is how pilots account for the rotation of the Earth when they're flying an aircraft, even a high-speed aircraft like a 747. Glad I could clear that up for you. So the optimal flight plan, if they were if they were going from one, would be something like this. But really, their flight plan would probably be somewhere in the middle. They'd actually go at a different heading, not head straight towards Mexico City, so that they can you know, optimize their arc in space. I didn't calculate that would be, but I assume it would be like, well, Brandon, you know what happens when you assume. This is why I absolutely love flat earthers, because they have no idea how to do any long distance navigation, but they certainly have an opinion on how it should be done. This has no bearing on reality. I showed you the actual ground track between Anchorage, Alaska and Mexico City. I'm not going to bother with it again, but that's how you plan a flight. Now, next time when you want to put something like this out, why don't you have a chat with me? or Wolfie 6020, or Blue Marble Science. We're all pilots. We all know how to do long distance navigation over our beautiful rotating spherical Earth. We're happy to go ahead and give you some instruction on this and explain it to you to your satisfaction. And then maybe you won't come out and make silly videos like this one that just highlight your misunderstanding of the problem in the first place. Just trying to help out. Question number three, since the return flight from Mexico City to Anchorage can take advantage of the additional momentum imparted by moving from greater to lower rotation speeds and into Earth's rotation instead of against it, the total distance in space and engine effort required is significantly lower. The geodetic distance for the return flight is 3759, equivalent to the stationary Earth geodetic distance. Do pilots account for these differences in their flight plans? You know, dear God, Brandon, I don't believe you actually did this. Are you trying to say that if I go from Anchorage, Alaska down to Mexico City, when I go from Mexico City back to Anchorage, Alaska, it's going to be a different distance? The distance between any two points on Earth does not change whether you go from point A to point B or point B to point A. This is kind of like a very basic concept that you should have probably learned in elementary school. Now, I've already demonstrated that the reason that you're raising this question is that you do not understand how flight paths work over our spherical rotating Earth. It's the same as if it was a non-rotating spherical Earth. It's a great circle course. Now, this little illustration that you put up, while it is interesting, it has no bearing on reality, and that's not a flight path. This is the flight path. And it doesn't matter if you're coming or going. It's the same flight path. If you're flying between those two cities, you will be over that magenta line with minor variations due to weather and air traffic control concerns. Hopefully that took care of your question. But let's see if there's any other part to it. Meaning, do they account for the fuel requirement differences from going south to north and the uh, distance that they travel through space and the increase in power that is required for them to gain momentum? 
Do, does anybody have any evidence that any of these considerations are accounted for when estimating fuel requirements for north to south or south to north flights? So those are my three questions, and there's a whole bunch of other considerations that I didn't even get to yet that I want to see what people come back with and then address. Well, there you have it. I addressed your three questions, Brandon. The reason I didn't address them in the first part was they were moot to begin with because I basically destroyed your entire concept of how flight planning was done. There's the flight plan between Anchorage and Mexico City. I can't tell you this enough times. These other silly little flight tracings that you did, uh, that you, in your flurf mind with your flat earth fantasy narrative came up with, those have no basis in reality. Those are not the actual flight paths nor the ground tracks of the aircraft that fly between Mexico City and Anchorage. So, hopefully that cleared it up. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thanks again for stopping by. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. And we do have some merchandise, we have memberships, and even a Patreon if you want to support the channel. So until I see you again, take care, guys. Thanks again for stopping by.